Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When a newly elected official, like a prime minister or a president, uh, sends to a new position of power, they often bring along a core group of people that they trust along with them into power. Typically, this is a group of people who are among the most instrumental and loyal in helping them to achieve this new position of power. And they're often rewarded with pay raises, thank you gifts, perhaps even promotions. When the president becomes the president, there's quite a lot in the United States government that doesn't change. However, chief among the commander in chief's new powers are, is the power to appoint a variety of positions, and perhaps the most important positions are the president's cabinet. This includes people like the attorney general and the Department of Defense, or the the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Resources, among many others. In the ancient world, it was much the same. You always wanted to get on the good side of the chief, right? And even at work, we know that it's better to be on the good side of the boss, and you feel more comfortable, and you feel significantly less comfortable when the boss doesn't like you. And typically, most good leaders want their, their followers to know that Loyalty will be rewarded, and so they do reward those who are most, most loyal and faithful with privilege, power, and public praise. Kings in the ancient world likewise rewarded loyalty by appointing generals, leaders, and other positions of power. Paul makes reference to this when he quotes Psalm 68. Psalm 68 is a victory psalm written by King David about God's victory. Now, it's easy to forget, but David was actually a great military leader. He, the people, perhaps you recall, used to sing, Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his tens of thousands. David had mighty men. He won many important victories. And of course, he defeated Goliath. But it's easy to forget that David did all these things, perhaps because David never really makes mention of himself when he brings these things back to mind. Whenever he's talking about victory, David either says, thank you, God, for giving me victory, or sometimes, like in Psalm 68, he never even really mentions himself. He simply talks about God's victories. David boasts and brags. He he remembers fondly past victories, and he's confident about future contests. But he's never boasting or bragging about himself. He simply boasts and brags about the Lord. Well, Psalm 68 really emotes this exaltation and even bragging about the victory of God. All the pomp and fanfare that a a king would normally receive and rejoice in, well, David ascribes that to the Lord. Paul's point in quoting Psalm 68 about God giving gifts among his people is that Jesus is newly ascended to sit at the right hand of God the Father and to rule the heavens and the earth. And now that he is ruling, he is sharing his gifts with you and me as his people. If you're the fan of a sports team, it it kind of feels like you've won whenever your sports team wins. At the Olympics, all the different nations feel as if they have won whenever an individual from their country wins. Now, there are a variety of gifts that we share in because of Christ's victory. Uh, Jesus has now joined the human team. He's on our side when he could have been against us. Now he's one of us. Furthermore, Paul sh- says that he shares his gifts with us. But what exactly are those gifts? I hope I'm not making light of God gifts when I say that forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation are are good and important, but they're not exactly Paul's focus here. Rather, Paul's focused on uh, God ruling now and what our life and role is like in this world and how we lead other people towards Christ. Now, I don't want us to lose sight of this really high praise and position that Jesus and Paul ascribe to the church. We are, in fact, among the most important and influential leaders in the entire world. Now, of course, that doesn't mean we're all going to become political rulers, but we are in a variety of positions within Christ's church, the body of Christ. And that means that we are involved in one of the hidden and yet most important kingdoms of the world, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of the gospel, the coming kingdom and reign of heaven. 
Paul doesn't say, though, that we're going to be generals or attorney generals or secretaries of defense or Department of Human Health and Resources. But he does has a, have a list of the kinds of positions that he is appointing to his people in the church. The kingdom of the gospel includes prophets, evangelists, teachers, among others. Now, this is not the only place where Paul has a list like this. He has these all over the epistles. And frankly, a lot of them are different in the details. The point is not to focus so much on one particular gift as to focus on the importance of the different and varied roles that we play in the church of God and the coming kingdom of God's power. And that's Important and healthy for us to remember, the church, we're not just a collection of volunteers and paid employees. We're part of advancing the kingdom of God in this place. A member of the altar guild or Sunday school teacher, an elder, we're not just cogs in a machine. We're working together so that Christ can give his gifts like the Lord's Supper to his people. We're establishing a beachhead in our own lives and in our families and our neighborhoods. We bring the rain mercy and compassion of Christ to those around us wherever we go. And that's why Paul is encouraging the Ephesian church to stay on the same page. After all, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. If everyone's doing their own thing or pulling against one another, things will never go anywhere. It's important that God's people stay on the same page as well. If half of our community dinner committee, for example, wanted to make spaghetti one night, but the other half wanted to make cheeseburgers, well, we'd run into problems. You know, what's most important is not that we agree about every last detail of how the church looks, or even if we see exactly the same page on different strategies, or have the same opinions about what's going on in the world around us. What matters is that we're all pulling towards our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And even if we step on each other's toes or disagree sometimes, as long as we're following all after our Lord, a, a good dose of patience, uh, forgiveness and God's spirit will get us right back on the right track. Now, these days, it's easy for the church to go into survival mode, to kind of hunker down and just wait for the world to pass us by. But Christ has called us to be a light to the nations. We are leaders in this world is what we're learning today. Oh, now, we're not promised power or endless pleasure or slaves in the life hereafter. No, rather, we are called to lead in Christ church and to lead as our Savior would lead. We, for instance, uh, take care of minor details of making sure the church is properly put together. We teach one another and even children to learn law and gospel, and uh, we introduce them to Jesus. We're willing to shine the light of the gospel on whoever comes our way and hopefully even wherever we go. We are leaders examples in God's kingdom. The gospel is written on our hearts, and we speak it with our whole being. We share it in the way we raise our families or interact with our friends or co-workers or even with our own church, the, the way we speak, the way we pray. While we lead as God's people, we're not really in the lead, are we? No, rather we follow Christ who has ascended to glory. And furthermore, we seek, kind of like King David, to give him all the glory. And we, we invite others to come with us to glorify the faithful king and, and savior of us all. What an awesome and privileged task our Lord has called us to. So let us walk by grace, extend the grace of God to others as we congregate and lead together here at Grace. In Jesus' name, Amen.